Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's Matt Coleman here from Magnify World. Today we have another very special guest in our series of the top 50 most interesting companies in the emerging technology space. I'm speaking from our Los Angeles studio, obviously. That's where we all are. And, uh, and our fellow companion here today is Varag Garabjanian. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Having Excellent. Everyone. So Virag is from Clay Air in Los Angeles. They've got a very unique product, which we can't wait to hear about. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about gesture control. And I'm going to let him uh, first, though, start with his history and how he got into uh, what he calls deep tech um, and emerging technology. So, yeah, please tell us a little bit more about your background and, and what you do as Chief Revenue Officer at, at Clay. For sure. Thanks again for having me, Matt. So uh, I'm Barag, uh, currently CRO at, at Clay Air. Clay Air is a software company doing computer vision in the XR space and other industries as well. I started my career in actually in Orange County in product management, and that's where I first got into deep tech, I'd say. It was around mesh networking technology back in like the 3G era, uh, so decentralized data transfer between mobile devices. And that really got me hooked into how, you know, a deep tech or new technologies can like kind of move the needle for user experiences. And then from there, I went into the East Coast and did a stint in management consulting for a couple of years at a little boutique firm. It was called Endeavor Partners. We worked with more, you know, deep tech, big companies there too. So I worked a lot with Samsung, you know, companies like HTC, carriers as well. And it was really around like, you know, how, again, you know, technology can change user experiences, what emergence of new technologies could change, you know, products and, and user experience, especially in mobile again. After that, I uh, went to grad school. I went, uh, MIT was right across the street. So obviously MIT is full of a bunch of different kinds of neat and new novel technologies. I really wanted to go there because uh, of all the, you know, possible different inflection points of, of how tech can, you know, change the world. And that's when I, my, you know, during my summertime, I discovered, you know, uh, the XR industry. So uh, in the AR and VR space at that time in 2015 or 2016, things were pretty hot, especially, um, you know, with the acquisition of Oculus and a lot of their activity. And I really saw XR as, you know, the new computing platform of the future. And that really, really excited me. So I went out to Silicon Valley at a company called Applied Materials, even more uh, deep tech, if you will, a company that builds the, you know, semiconductor equipment you know, and software that enables all the chipsets that go out there into the world. And so... I dove into the XR space, understood what the hardware landscape was. I got really excited about it. And I knew that at least in my career over the next 20, 30 years, uh, there would definitely be another computing platform and XR would be maybe the best candidate. So, you know, after that, I did a uh, stint in venture capital as well, too. I worked more with finding startups in, in the LA uh, ecosystem um, back before, you know, started booming and eventually ended up at Clay. And, and the reason for Clay is that I think, you know, the way that we interact with new emerging devices, critical for their adoption. And so that's where, you know, Clay spends most of its time is figuring that out for companies. Tell yeah. us what the, the air stands for and the meaning behind that and, and how your product actually works on the world, because it's an interesting integration and controller for the development community to really take note of this. And, and how long has it been available for? Yeah. So air, so clay air, air stands for um, artificial intelligence recognition. And so that points to the fact that we use AI part of, you know, how the hands are tracked from cameras and how any gesture the hands commit is recognized. And so the way we're deploying this right now uh, is to device makers first to kind of optimize the software for the hardware environment, which is, you know, uh, a big problem to solve that I think we've made a lot of progress on and made it easier. Uh, from then, Developers can access, you know, the Clay SDK, Clay Air SDK, either, you know, through us or in, in many cases, you know, we might white label with the big device maker. So once, you know, an enterprise or, a, or an end user or developer picks up that device, they will have access to that SDK as well. Excellent. So as part of your role, you've got, it seems like a more of a wider role than just revenue. You're, you're in the product strategy group and marketing as well and a bit of business development. I mean, What's um what has been your project strategy? Because you've got three different core focuses called clay reality and drive and control. Yeah. Um, can you can you explain the, the the roadmap there and the options? Sure. 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's three products, like you said, is the clay, you know, reality, uh, you know, vertical. And I think that's where we spend most of our time. And historically, when I started uh, from a functional perspective, I was doing more business development uh, in that space. And that's probably a store I spend the majority of my time. Um, but then we've also opened up into different verticals as well. So there's clay drive. And what that means is allowing you know, drivers or passengers in cars to not have to just be able to use a gesture whether it's a grab or a swipe, right? To be able to you know, manipulate the infotainment system, uh, which is becoming a bigger part of every driving experience, you know, just with their own hands, right? Not having to reach. And that, that helps with, you know, with, uh, with safety and attention to driving. And then the third vertical as well is uh, clay control. It's kind of a catch-all for any device that has a camera, we can still control with our hands at a distance as well. And so functionally, I've been like, like I said, started with business development, but as you know, as things have grown, it's turning more into, you know, uh, strategy in terms of which direction we go in what order, how much effort and dollars we put into each of those markets, uh, who we hire, um, how to manage projects once we've, you know, once we've won clients and, you know, always rolling that back into how the roadmap and the technology should, should adapt to different KPIs that are important to like to reach in each one of those. So, yeah. So just going back to the gestures, there's, there's, is there about 20 or 30, I think, different gestures that you can make with your hands and you don't need any controllers in your hands. It basically, the algorithms basically are built in what to the headset and mm-hmm. then basically read the environment, scan the environment and manipulate certain <coughs> actions. Um, can, right. you te- can you tell us about, you know, your driving examples that you've, um, that you're working on? Yeah, for, so for Clay Drive, uh, the one example we can point to is our project with a company called Renault, a French automotive maker. It's one of the first you know, clients the company had because the, the technology was you know, started in France as well. And you know, in that case, we've done you know, several you know, uh, POV, uh, POCs with them, and uh, it's now in like that commercialization stage. Pretty much we're using gestures to control the infotainment sense system, like I said before. Uh, different gestures, like I can't see the exact ones, but the functions maybe we could speak to a bit is like, you know, answering phone calls or, or, you know, uh, manipulating, you know, menus to make them easier to reach, uh, zooming in, zooming out, volume control as well too. Those, those types of things of what I've been experimented with. We're right in that phase of like narrowing that down and implementing into like the, the, the cars that are coming on board. Pretty cool. Yeah. So, so basically it's, um, if you're driving along and, you know, the, the phone rings, you basically just can have a hand gesture to tap and a digital interface at eye level uh, or at a comfortable level. Right. Uh, and and you're, then you're in basically. Right. So yeah. 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 So that's amazing how that works. I mean, it seems like, you know, in that, in that, in that category, I would say like the key thing is every second counts. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, especially with imagine like Uber drivers today, as an example, they've got, they've got smartphones up on their dashboard. They're always, you know, trying to control them, touch them, move menus around, not safer while we're still driving, right? So the idea here is that we could just even shave off just a couple seconds of attention. Uh, it should move the needle, right, in terms of safety. Yeah, that's true. Very true. And so the main business is more focused on, you know, XR and the, the reality program that you, that you have. I know you've worked with various headset manufacturers. Um, can you tell me about you know, where, where you are at the moment and, and, you know, the commercialization of the product? Yeah, for sure. So right now we're in a place where um, we've finally reached the point where our algorithms work on the most number of headsets possible as compared to before, if you rewind two years ago, there weren't nearly as many devices that had cameras on board facing inside out. Right. right? Today, that number and percentage of penetration of cameras on those headsets has grown tremendously. I can't give you an exact figure, but it's definitely, you know, the majority of devices now. And so unlike in the past, you know, now we're in a place where the the software has been tuned for those cameras. And part of that is through our work with Qualcomm and our partnership there, because they define, you know, a lot of the, uh, the the hardware that goes into the majority of these devices as well. They've got, you know, dominant uh, market share in this space by far. So, you know, the software in that way has reached a point where we can now, you know, get the amount of key points tracked. So on each hand, we can track as many as 22 points 
So you can have as many as 44 points tracked on the hand. And so that's more than enough for what you need, you know, in an, uh, in an AR or VR experience. And in terms of commercializing that, any new device maker that now is, you know, coming to, you know, the Qualcomm platform and saying, hey, you know, we want to, we want to, you know, use this platform that Qualcomm has built this new chipset and, and the reference design around it, they can, they can be rest assured that like place technology will work just fine on that. And it's been optimized for those devices. And that's something we're constantly working on. So we're future proof as well too. And, you know, there's been some device makers that, have, that we're allowed to speak to that have already done this. We made some announcements with, uh, with Lenovo is a big, you know, a, obviously a huge device maker beyond XR, but they've launched, uh, you know, a series or a family of enterprise uh, AR headsets. The first one um, being a six, do they call it? I think reality uh, platform. And so our gestures are in that device and we're constantly improving it now to include, you know, other things that are, that are coming on. And then uh, another company called Unreal as well, which is uh, probably the, the kind of a flagship, more consumer facing AR device that's in the middle of implementing our technology as well too. So, and there's more, there's more uh, coming for sure as, as the market continues to grow and new players come on. So do you, is there any market research or statistics that you can actually pass back through to the operator or the hen, you know, the, the Qualcomm's or the, the Oculus's or the Lenovo's to actually, you know, create a better experience or better headsets actually in the future and do you think that that current hand controllers that manipulate you around um, the different worlds, you know, in VR, um, mm-hmm. would you replace that in the future? Would you do? Would you do you think in the next five years you will actually even need a hand, you know, a hard hand controller if you have your way? Yeah. Is that your vision? Yeah, it's a really good question. I'll answer the first one around. You know, is there any data we can pass back? Uh, to improve the experience. I think that's what you asked. Yeah. And I, I would say that, you know, we can, if we can track, you know, the, the position of the hands in real time of 22 different points, we can also map that to, you know, what users are doing in like in the AR or VR environment that they are in. So similar, I would say, you know, we haven't gone to this point yet, you know, but, but similar to how, you know, you'd be able to track, I know, a mouse and keyboard, on a website or, you know, touch on a smartphone and, and, you know, what's going on there. I, this is one more input in the XR space. There's others as well too. And it will kind of give you maybe a heat map of like engagement, right? Of where, where a user is particularly interacting with their hands. If you couple that with eye tracking, if you couple that with other sensors that can, that can track like, you know, their, uh, their, their, you know, their brain activity, crazy things like that. You can get like an inc- amazingly detailed picture of how a user, what their intent is and, and what their engagement is like while they're using experience. So that's definitely possible. Uh, I haven't done that yet, I would say. Definitely though, still making, you know, improvements on the, the hardware product because we're always, you know, looking at what, what machine learning can do and what cameras would make that easier uh, while keeping form factor and cost and, you know, bill of materials all in mind. So that's already happening. And then, and then to your question about, uh, you know, controllers, I don't think that this is always a replacement for controllers. I think in the future, in terms of, it depends on how you kind of segment the market in short. So if we're talking about consumer devices, you know, three to five years from now, where it's all about, you know, making form factors smaller and smaller and smaller and cheaper and less friction for users to, to pick up these devices and actually use them on a day-to-day basis, I absolutely think there is... This is a this is this would be a way of potentially like you know not needing a controller for most of the functions you would use right between voice and hands you should be fine but I would yeah. say even a consumer like when it comes to gaming controllers can still make sense particularly when it comes to like haptic feedback uh, you want like you know controllers and feedback on buttons if you're trying to like I don't know pull a trigger on a fake gun in a game that might feel a little bit better with a controller. And then similarly, I would say in enterprise use cases, there are some specialized use cases. There's a company, for example, called uh, Sixth Sense, I believe is their name, where they've got like fake torches, you know, and that's, that, that I'm not going to you know, be able to recreate uh, with just vision, computer vision, right? And tell us what's another case study, a couple of case studies you can go into in terms of the XR products that you've, that you've done in, um, is there uh, consumer-based products that you can tell us about or enterprise products? 
in particular, or are you focused anywhere in between there? Or I'd say most of our time has been spent with the device makers and how you know third parties pick up those devices and use them is probably how our technology gets used, right? So, and but we are you know kind of expanding that, and we are going more and more direct to you know independent software vendors who are who are writing apps as well too. So the way we're seeing it now, at least on the enterprise side, is some of the use cases you already see for AR more generally, right? So remote assistance, instructions for you know people on you know manufacturing lines or maintenance, and gestures are being used there, and they can be used to help communicate. So if I'm a remote, if I'm someone who's got a headset on and I'm like and I'm looking at you know, something I've got to maintain or fix, and I got someone who can see my point of view, I can also telestrate what I'm looking at and annotate objects in real space. And that can be done both locally as well too. If I've got you know four people looking at a 3D model and we're each communicating with each other, you know, one of us can, you know, can annotate what we're looking at, write notes about that. That can be done. And, and on the consumer side, uh, really this is like, could be potentially part of every experience on what a consumer does, right? If they're moving windows around, so you can imagine the future for Unreal, they've got an operating system where they want to move one window from here to there. You can just, you know, pick up, drag and move. Right. So it kind of becomes the, the keyboard and mouse, if you yeah. will, at some level of like, of what XR will be. Right. So, so you touched on, you touched on a bit of training there and uh, education, which I know we wanted to talk about in more detail. And obviously there's never been a better time to introduce products like this and in the emerging tech space, just only simply because a lot of the colleges and universities and schools, you know, aren't really prepared for 100% online use, right? Where where do you see, first of all, there's the enterprise side on more of the training. I can see a medical, you know, many medical examples on how you would train a surgeon in different parts of the world using hand gesture and 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 remote learning. I mean, what are some of the other examples you think that would be great for this? Or, I, or even in play? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say um, on the healthcare front, I'll just double down on that for a second here. There is some interesting stuff that's going on, right? So definitely surgical training. So if a surgeon, you know, uh, has, especially this is a little bit more for medical students. I think when a surgeon's already been, you know, through residency, they don't, many, many cases, they don't need this, right? But if you're like, you know, if, if you're an early resident, first, second year, or you're a medical student, I've tried some, some VR experiences where, you can jump in and and at least go through the procedural steps and and we can simulate different you know different uh, different things that can happen to the patient right so unlike doing one linear surgery where it's just like beginning and end and this is what it's going to be i can you know it's 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 unity we can make anything happen we can simulate anything we want right and that that as a as a theme i think is really cool across education is that you know we we don't have to go through one linear experience i could i could provide as many as, as you like, right? And, and change the experience along the way based on what happens. So that's, that's a pretty neat feature. Also in, also in healthcare, there's also a lot of things going on like in therapy as well too. So there's a really w- wonderful company in LA called Applied VR. Actually, they're LA based and they do some really awesome stuff with you know, post-op. If, if someone is, is struggling with pain, you know, pain management as well too, they can put them in a VR experience and literally make them feel like they're not in a hospital, they can make them feel like they're somewhere else. And, you know, if you just do that for 10 minutes a day, the data is starting to come out about how, you know, that's actually pretty effective. Yeah. And um, so I'm excited about that. I'm also say like, you know, with the fact that we can't see each other anymore, I think one of the reasons why, you know, I love these kinds of technologies is it can, it could actually be the way we, we bridge people together. Strangely enough, the way we use devices today, smartphones and laptops, like, although we're doing this now over video, it's connecting us, but it's kind of halfway connecting us, right? We don't feel like we're in the same place. And that's ultimately uh, what mobile devices do is they, they take us away from being in the same space. And VR is trying to kind of complete that last 50% and make us feel present in the same space together. At least that's what VR is trying to do. And uh, that's really, really fascinating. That has implications in every single industry. So, yeah. If you really think about the younger generation as well at schools, what's going on at the moment, I mean, they're in LA County, they've just gone 100% online. It's been five months to put something together, right? So it is a long time, but you know, there's been a long summer break. Yes. But I think, you know, what what even VR and AR can potentially bring to that, and and your technology is 
collaboration with the students again, right? For um, sure. And obviously, I don't can't see a you know a twenty four hour or a, a six day a six hour you know day in VR for them, no, but yeah. for specific subjects and and learning to collaborate again with students, which they can't meet, it is important. But I would imagine your technology would be great enhancing a gamification even at that younger age. Yeah. What, 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 what are you thinking that you, you could do around um, the younger generation and in the education market? Would that be it's more a, geography or tourism or um, what? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, I think that um, from an application standpoint, you know, we don't, we don't have, you know, obviously we're, we're not an application company, so we don't, we don't build this there, right? But in terms of what I think would be interesting to target in the enterprise in the education space would be, you know, in particular, you could do the, you, you could do like the field trips, right? We cannot do that anymore. So we can like, we can do, uh, you know, photogrammetry, capture an environment, and then have students visit places they, they wouldn't be able to visit before, right? I can make a student feel like they're in, if they want to go visit China, they can go visit China, right? Without any risk, just the click of a button or anywhere else. That's really cool. Right. And then to have the memory that felt like they were present. Awesome. I, I, I'm particularly interested in like, in, in actually like scientific concepts and, and how we can make that a little bit easier to understand because, you know, just doing things over video or just pieces of paper and showing images like that, it just doesn't work. Like things like physics, even chemistry, it's kind of hard sciences to be able to take students to like that subatomic level if they need to. And like, just, be around an atom and watch the way the motion of subatomic particles move at like life-size form, you know, like expanding on that. That's just really, that's something you can't do uh, with other kinds of technology. Only VR can help you do that. Right. Uh, same thing with other, other kinds of concepts in physics, right. And we can make different simulations. Yeah. And I think that's just awesome. No, it's, it's great. A, it's, it's just great to talk about, you know, some of the applications it might inspire a developer out there listening to this to, to use your technology and create something. Uh, yeah. You know, it's certainly the right time. So how does, you know, they have to basically buy, is it a plugin that is, um, has, to, has to be added on once they buy the headset or what's the access uh, area for a developer these days? Yeah, good, 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 good question. Eventually this could be something, you know, if we fast forward two to three years, this could be something that at the unity level, everybody can access because there's been enough sort of integration between what the software can do with all the emerging hardware that will be around in two to three years. Today, it's still a little bit more manual than that. So we still require a little bit of a partnership with that device maker first, just to make sure that it'll work. If we offered it in unity today, I think the, the challenge would be that, you know, okay, someone wants this algorithm now to run on a, ca a camera set that, the algorithms weren't tuned for. So this has happened in the past. We're trying, you know, with other incumbent players that have tried what we're doing before, and we're trying to get around that. And so there's pros and cons, right? It's going to take a little bit longer, but when it happens, it'll be done right. And, and when it's, let's say, you know, the partnership with Unreal is, you know, like when it comes to fruition there for developers to use, it'll come through the Unreal SDK. There might be something in Unity that it, they can access as well too, right? So on a, on a device by device basis until it's, you know, very abundantly yeah. out. Yeah. Excellent. So let's switch gears. I know we wanted to talk about um, patents and the deep tech and then, yeah. you know, advanced tech, which is really what clay is. Can you just explain to the viewers how you view, you know, deep tech in the XR industry? And I know we wanted to m maneuver that into, um, you know, what, what's uh, potential patents. I know you guys filed a number of patents, um, you know, which is which is an important part of your business model uh, mm -hmm. for investors, I would imagine, but also protecting your intellectual property. Yeah, just to go back to the deep tech, how do you explain that? Sure. Yeah, in, in the XR space, you know, the opportunities for deep tech, I think that they're more and more being, you know, swallowed up by the big players, right? So, uh, you know, before, maybe four years ago, there was a lot of different startups building even the different little pieces of the infrastructure that's required to make a whole, you know, pair of XR, you know, glasses or H head mounted displays come to fruition. Now, most of that is done by the big guys. There are some still, still some pockets 
uh, companies like us, we fall into one of those pockets, right? So there's still probably some opportunity in all the CV algorithms. So that doesn't just mean hand tracking. That means, you know, things like plane detection. So allowing the cameras to see where different planes are in the environment, whether there's a table, right, or, or a wall. And the purpose of that being that you could, you know, in, in AR or even in VR, be able to stitch content to that accordingly in an intelligent way. Object recognition is another important CV algorithm to be able to have smart glasses be able to identify an object in the room and, and then inform the uh, user about what that is. Others could be, you know, what we call six degrees of freedom spatial tracking. So being able to understand like where the user is in the in positional environment. And that's important. And then of course, hand tracking and body tracking. These are all things that are still being done by some startups, but also the big players are starting to work on as well. And uh, there might be still be some room for some hardware. So in XR specifically, you know, how we do optics and how we do, uh, you know, different waveguides hasn't been perfectly hammered out yet. And so there's a few companies like DigiLens is one of them um, that is really pioneering some of that stuff. And it, and it involves several PhDs doing hardcore, you know, material science and, and more to, to like actually make that come to fruition. Patents, uh, to answer that part, are really, a really important part of any deep tech company that uh, because that's your asset most of the time, especially if you're doing software, I mean, that's your asset at the end of the day. But I, I also think like there's a lot of most, most patents are, you know, kind of erroneous and, and not don't have too much value for deep tech companies. I think the hitting the nail on the head is finding what the problem is, building the, the technology to solve that problem in an either faster, better or cheaper way uh, than what's already out there. And then that patent definitely has some value. So in our case at Clay, I think we have like a couple that are or more that are granted and several that are pending, all related to mostly related to like hand tracking, but also, you know, uh, computer vision more broadly and how you train images and, and get insights from them. Well, so um, just what we're going to wrap up in um, yeah. just some final comments here, but tell us about, I mean, what I'm excited about with the future for this industry, in particular is smart glasses. And, mm -hmm. you know, I keep on raving on about how I wrote an article three and a half years ago on smart glasses, the future of shopping, right? Okay. How wrong was I, you know, because, you know, I would have to carry around my magic leap, you know, <laughs> that yeah. I wouldn't be able to see anything other than a game inside the console, right? Yeah. So, and, and then people would have thought I was crazy. Um, I mean, what Apple's announcement, obviously, and we talk about this a lot, you know, it's great to see that they've, they've announced, you know, something in this area. Enreal, who you're currently working with, is an amazing company as well. There's quite a few out on the market. How excited are you about the future of the industry? And um, yeah, what, what words can you leave us with here? I agree with you that it's taken longer than I think most folks expected. That being said, like if I look at what's happened so far since I you know, joined in the industry, I mean, we went from, let's just say on the VR side, you know, a place where you know, it was $2,000, let's say for an HTC you know, device, and you needed a really complex computer. You had trackers that were all around the room. So you had tons of different hardware, right? To, to actually just enable the experience, low resolution displays, all that kind of stuff. And you were tethered, you know, fast forward four years with Oculus Quest, it's about a $400, $500 device. Uh, you don't have any external trackers. There's no cable and you can do everything you could have done four years earlier. So that's pretty good. I'd say that being said, like, you know, I think there were some folks that were in the industry betting on the fact that by now being 2020, you can imagine like 2015, that's 2020 sounds pretty futuristic. You know, people are thinking like, okay, everyone's going to be doing all their computing in XR. And that's what I'm excited for. I don't think we're anywhere close to that, to be perfectly honest. Like, I don't even think, yeah, at least on the VR side, we're not going to be doing computing in VR until all the things that we do on a laptop today can happen in VR. And that's just not, it's just not there. The install base is not there. Uh, the content makers, even for gaming, haven't really moved in hardcore yet. Right. So I think it's going to start with gaming on the VR side and that could actually start to, uh, you know, create, you know, money in, the, in this part of the market, the consumer VR part on the enterprise side, there's definitely things happening. Like we spoke about training in different in verticals is a big one where there continues to be improvement and value added type of applications. Uh, when it comes to your example of like, you know, the magically do, you know, shopping in AR, I think Unreal is the best shot that we've got today for consumer augmented reality. It's a platform for people to innovate and see how they can get things even better. I don't see it as like a mass, doesn't need to be, I don't think they're planning to be like a massively adopted device, 
but definitely in the hundreds of thousands where we could see how people behave with it, what they like to do with it, what they don't, you know, and then iterate from there. The fact that Apple's in the game is probably one of the biggest sources of hope for the industry is because they don't, they don't really like, as you know, Apple doesn't like to engage with the rest of the XR community as much, a little bit more private. We know that they're working on something and we know that, you know, in, in doing things in consumer with devices, especially thing on the face, it's, it needs to be more aesthetic than ever, right? Even more than a smartphone. And so there's only one company that's got, you know, the brand and the cash and the design skills to do that really, really well. And that's Apple. So I think they are going to launch something. And when they do, let's say in three or three or four years, then it'll be an inflection point. And I think the best analogy to showcase where we are right now, where we're going is, is uh, the smartwatch market. I like to use that as an example. Like, you know, I'm wearing an Apple watch now. Uh, but if you imagine there was several years before the Apple watch launch where you had like Moto 360 and you had Samsung gear and that's where we're at right now where a lot of players are iterating. And then uh, at least on the consumer side, Apple could bring it all together uh, and, and we'll see where it goes from there. It doesn't mean there isn't room for other players. And that's what a clay. That's definitely what we're betting on as well too, is that this is a new platform where all the market share is not just going to be Apple. It's going to be other players. It's a different skill set. So We'll see where it goes. Fantastic. Well, it's been great chatting today, Virag. Um, yeah. But before we leave, please uh, give yourself a shout out on where they can, our viewers can find you on LinkedIn and also your company as well. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, if you go to uh, uh, clayair.io, you'll find us there. And then also you can find me on LinkedIn my, with my first name, Virag. Uh, there isn't many with that name. And uh, I'm happy to connect with anyone in this space uh, who wants to just, you know, see what's going on, learn more about it or learn more about our technology and, uh, or any other, you know, uh, deep tech entrepreneur who's trying to figure out how the, the business development part of their business. I'm happy to, to join them and, uh, and help any way I can. Hey, look, I really appreciate your time today and your busy schedule. I know we're all got back to back zoom calls. <laughs> it's the new way of life. And but thanks very much for your um, thought leadership today and uh, input uh, into the, the future of uh, this space. And we look forward to catching up. Uh, again soon. Matt, for sure. Thank you for your interest in doing this podcast. It's awesome. So please keep it up. Thank you.